Welcome back to our classroom. We got a great episode today. We're going to be talking about literary device mixtapes. That's right, y'all. Bringing you back to the 90s. <laughs> I'm here with Abby Ramos Stanitz, and she's doing some amazing work. I follow her content on TikTok, and I have appreciated what she is offering us, what she's offering educators, what she's offering the world with the content that she creates, which is certainly resourceful. If you're in the classroom, you're looking for support, you're looking for different ways to engage, particularly the ELA classroom, but this is, she offers some best practices for classrooms in general, then you should definitely follow her on TikTok. And later on, she'll let us know where else we could follow her. But I'm excited to learn from you today, Abby. So thank you for coming into our classroom. Hi, thanks for having me. My pleasure, my pleasure. Why don't we get started by you sharing a little bit about who you are and what you do so the audience can familiarize themselves with you? Um, yeah, kind of like you mentioned. Um, so I am Abby Ramos Stanitz, and I am teaching currently in San Antonio. I've been teaching language arts of all levels, um, reading, language and literature, advanced placement, you know, everything um, for about 16 years in Houston, Dallas, and now San Antonio. I've always worked um, in a language arts classroom and always in a Title I school my entire career my entire career. And so I'm just, you know, out there putting TikToks together, trying to help other teachers. You know, I feel like we all really need a network out there. So I just share my best practices, some activities that I do, and really just try to make it like, you know, a nationwide classroom. Like the more we share, uh, the better off we all are and the better off our kids are. So that's just a little bit about me. Yeah, I love it. And I'm definitely part of your nationwide classroom as is Lorena. <laughs> And so let's get into it. What are literary device mixtapes and what inspired this approach? Yeah, so I have always been just an avid music lover. I'm like the kind of person that has music in the shower. I've got a playlist for the drive to work, I've got a playlist for the workout, you know, all of that. So I was always, you know, I burned CDs back in the day. I don't know if you did. Yes, of course. Uh, yeah, I like installed my CD burner and all that. So when I started teaching, I knew I wanted to use song lyrics um, you know, to explicate as poetry and to like mimic literary devices. But I found that when I chose the poem, you know, it only reached a certain amount of kids, right? It's what I like. It's what I love. You know, I was the one telling them what I thought the, the song was about. And as you know, like we really want the thinking in the kids' hands. And obviously we want to make it a little more accessible. And at first, you know, when I was young, I thought like, oh, I know what the cool stuff is. You know, I know what the kids like. Um, but it turns out I, I did not know. And so the mixtape was where I, where I decided, you know what, they need to choose literary devices from their own music. That would be so much more powerful because it's really powerful to me when I hear songs that I like. You know, or even if I'm dancing and I hear something and I, you know, that registers with me with a lesson or something. And so I put together this assignment where students have to choose um, different songs that show examples of all these literary devices that I've taught them. And then, you know, explain the lyrics and the effect on the reader. And then at the end, decide what tone that, that mixtape creates. Because as you know, if you ever got a mixtape, like the tone was where it's at, you know, was this a romantic mixtape? Was this like a BFF mixtape or, you know, pumping us up for the big game. And so kids really don't have that, um, that whole concept. I have to kind of go through it and it makes me feel like a dinosaur, but I have to say, you know, back in the day we used to do this and the closest they've ever come to is a playlist, which is similar. Um, but they really like this experience because they've never actually thought of doing it, like making a playlist for a person or for a purpose. Mm. And so I feel like we get a lot of benefits in the ELA classroom and it's just a lot of fun. Like the kids love it. I, you know, I love it. I learn a lot about music and kind of stay on top of things that way. So, yeah. Why don't you just keep building upon what the students enjoy about this lesson and why should teachers consider trying this lesson on? Yeah, I mean, um, I knew that it would be fun. It was fun to me. But then the very first time I rolled it out to the kids and I said, no, you get to listen with your earbuds or your headphones or whatever to the songs you actually like. They they just were like floored, like what you're letting me bring a device in this room. Mm -hmm. Number one, number wow. two. You're letting me listen to music that I actually like. We're not listening to kid bops or whatever. And, you know, I'll talk more about that later. But they just really love the choice. Right. They have 
you know, free access to music in other languages. They just have to translate it for me. I've gotten a lot of Spanish and in Korean, you know, pretty much any language, you know, that I've ever had a student and they've chosen some music from that genre. And I mean, they just really love the choice of it all. And what's been amazing are these aha moments that they have about deciding that someone is a good or a bad writer, right? So I mean, I don't want to put anybody on blast, but they are there are some artists out there that they think that they love, and they'll just be looking through the lyrics and say, man, this person doesn't really have anything to say. Like, they're not really saying anything, which I feel like is a powerful message for students to learn anyway. And then other times they end up with even more respect, like, man, like Cardi B actually is like pretty good at writing. And I'm like, yeah, you know, she is. So, you know, they build respect for writers in a way that actually like rings home to them. And um, I actually had some students over the years, because I've been doing this for like over a decade now, um, who will send me an email and be like, I was at the club and I heard a song and I knew it was assonance. And you've just ruined me, Miss Ramos. You've ruined me for life. I can't go to the club without thinking of literary devices. And I feel like that's a win. That's a win. So. That is definitely a win. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is awesome. Can, can you just build on why teachers should consider trying this lesson on? Yes. Okay. Well, number one, it's really easy. Um, there's very little prep work to it. You just list, well, you've teach the literary devices any way that you normally would, right? And we all have our own different ways of doing that. And so then you basically just create a list and you can differentiate that for different, you know, students say, okay, my honors class is going to get into like assonance and illusion and, you know, like some of the harder types of literary devices. And then I'm going to keep it more simple or, you know, that kind of thing. And then you just give the kids time and you walk around and you conference and you learn so much about the students. It is so useful to them. You're looking at author's purpose. You're looking at author's style, you know, the tone, all of these things that we're trying to get the kids to see work together they work together in a way that hits home for them. Plus, I mean, you're giving them choice. You're, you know, validating their own personal choices. Like, yes, the music you love is great. I'm not judging it in any way. Like, you know, your life and the things that you bring to our classroom are just as valuable as any piece of literature that I'm going to put in front of you all year. And I think that's really important, especially when you want everyone to feel represented in the classroom. That's right. That's good. That's good. So, how might a teacher in a state that has passed new laws to censor them approach oh, yeah. this lesson? Yeah, so um, that's a really good question. I did learn right away that there's a lot of um, cuss words in song yeah. lyrics. And, you know, there are a lot of metaphors out there that aren't especially classroom friendly. <laughs> um, 50 cent. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about that. But, um, you know, so um, what the what I would say to those teachers is to just give parameters and boundaries that you're comfortable with, right? So when kids write them down, I say, you know, there may be cuss words in your songs, but I want you to really think about if they're included in the literary devices, right? And they probably aren't. And if they absolutely must be included, then we put a first letter and some asterisks afterwards. And I need for you to write me a justification for what this means. And not, you know, 99 times out of a 100, any kid who has come to me and said like, I don't know, I think this song, they've actually kind of talked themselves out of it because what they learn is when you rely on a lot of those types of words, you're not actually doing a lot of, you know, fruitful writing. And so they say, oh, it's just kind of lazy. Like they just have cuss word after cuss word and they're not actually saying anything. And I'm like, yeah, but the kids have come across that themselves as opposed to being like, no, you're not allowed to do this. So if you give some boundaries around like, you know, no, you know, we're not going to use cuss words in our language or they need to be clean in this way. You know, they have to justify what they've chosen for you. And I always say with all my assignments, I think this is a good practice for all teachers to say whatever you're allowed to listen to and say it like five times and put it on the <laughs> on the document there so that they can't go home and say, Miss Ramos said I could listen to this. That's fine. So, you know. You know, the more documentation you have on that document, the better. So. That's right. That's right. Got to get ahead of them. A lot of proactive communication mm -hmm. yes. and being as clear as possible. But I love the fact that you're empowering the students, that you're allowing them to tap into what they love, what they enjoy, what they listen to, to tap into their voices and giving them freedom that sometimes they don't necessarily experience in the school setting. Yes, exactly. 
a lot of times we tell them what to do, what to think. We don't give them a whole lot of choice to explore and, you know, come across these realizations on their own, much less see all the devices work together. So it really is a beautiful thing. So what's on your mixtape playlist? And can you give us a breakdown of some of the literary devices you identified? Oh man, well yes, I I normally give the kids a kid excuse me the kids a list of about twenty five literary devices. So I mean I could make like the longest playlist of all time, but I've gotten pretty good at it. Um, one of my favorites uh, is situational irony, right? Situational irony is very difficult for the kids to find, and um, I had this one example brought to me years ago and I just thought it was one of the best examples I've ever seen, but it's the story. Um, if the song is called, does he love you? And it's by a band called Rilo Kylie, which is like an alternative band that I hadn't even heard of when I was teaching. I was like, who are these people? And you start reading the lyrics and it's like a conversation between these two friends. And one of the friends is saying, you know, that her husband is cheating on her and you know, all this stuff and how sad it is. And the woman's pregnant. It's like this whole narrative poetry thing and then at the end the best friend who has been there like patting on the back the whole time says don't worry he's never going to leave you for me and it's just like this ah and so then we'll bring it up to the kids I'll still use that as an example and they're like you wouldn't expect that right that's the opposite of what you'd expect and I'm like yeah that's as close we're going to get to probably situational irony in a song and they love like the narrative aspect of it so that would definitely be on my on my list um I also I have so many metaphor examples um, I have this, um, not to get too crazy, speaking of 90s though, there's this playlist I follow on Spotify called 90s Rump Shakers. And there's, um, I don't know if you remember the song, but the the all I want to do is zoom, 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 zoom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, that one, I would oh, definitely use that one. That for was, uh, I think that was Teddy Riley and them. Um, Black, was it Black Street? Oh, I mean, I actually, I need to look it up on my playlist. Really, I, I'm, bro, I'm, not, I'm like. I'm like 99.9% oh, .9 sure that Teddy Riley was definite, whether it was Black Street or not, it, Teddy Riley was involved. Oh, yeah. So like that's got like assonance in it and alliteration. I mean, just one of those songs on that playlist, I can go through and just pick all kinds of stuff. So plus, I mean, my queen, Beyonce, I mean... I could take that lemonade album and do the whole mixtape out of that. So, I mean, I just love it. The tone and, you know, the well, more alliteration, extended metaphor. And then there's a really old, um, I say old, but, you know, Paula Abdul song, like Cold Hearted Snake. I use this one all the time to explain it to the kids, but um, you know, the world's a candy store and he's been trick or treating and the girls just are like, man, he's getting around. I'm like, exactly. He's the, you know, the candy store, the ladies, and, you know, he's the trick or treater. So just a few of my examples and Drake, I use a lot of Drake in my examples because he's very, you know, universally loved by the kids. They're, he's kind of old school for them, but, you know, that's and, which is that saying a lot for us. Exactly. Exactly. I'm like <laughs> that youngster Drake, but, you know, for them, <laughs> old school, oh, so, man, that would definitely man. be on mine. And then um, J. Cole, I am. I have a newfound respect for J. Cole. I always liked him, but the more I see him on mixtapes, I'm like, he is a truly talented writer. Oh my goodness. J. I Cole's mean, just amazing. fantastic, you know, so. Yeah, J. J. Cole's gifted with the pen. Mm -hmm. and, and he also just does amazing things as a human being. Last week, I don't know if you're aware of this. Last week, he, you know, it came out on social media that he, he was looking for inspiration. Mm -hmm. And so he typed in YouTube, J. Cole type beat, because a lot of producers were trying to attract, you know, different folks to their sound. They'll make beats that are similar to what a J. Cole would ride or a Kendrick or, you know, so on and so yeah. forth, put their name on it. And so he, he looked up something and he came across this beat that this dude produced. I, I forgot the name of the dude. But it was a J. Cole type beat. J. Cole wrote to the instrumental and then contacted the dude and be like, hey, man, you know, I'm I'm feeling this beat. Thanks for creating this. I wrote a song to it. Here, you could use it for your platform. Do whatever you want with it. Just like, and I haven't followed, you know, in terms of the stats or whatnot, but I'm sure off the strength of J. Cole offering that to this dude, I'm sure it's attracted so many people, so many subscribers to that oh, guy's yeah. website. There's a, 
there's a popular YouTube channel that breaks down. They analyze rap lyrics and whatnot, and they did an analysis of that song. So that producer is now coming up on these different pages. Name is buzzing and whatnot. So shout out to J. Cole for just doing dope things. Yeah, seriously. Blessing people all over the place and just sharing that with us, sharing his art with us. Yes, yes. And Rum Shaker was, it was Rex and Effects. Right, it, okay. It you got Teddy, Teddy Riley did produce it. Okay. <laughs> You know, I was listening to it this afternoon, actually, in my planning period. So oh, <laughs> that's man. why it popped in my head. Yeah. 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 That's you <laughs> one. So. All right. If you had an opportunity to have lunch with any artist, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Wow. This is a really hard one for me. Um, I grew up like in a really eclectic musical family. And I just I don't know which way to go here with this one. But um you know, God, it's so hard. You know, it's like, do I go Beyonce? Do I go like a, you know, Stevie Nicks? Like, but I, you know, I, I know who it is. Oh, the range. That's, of, that's serious range. Yes, right I have there. a, yeah. I think I have to go with um, Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton. I wasn't ready. Yes, I think I have to go with Dolly Parton. I wasn't ready. Although I I'm, did, you know, I did follow Dolly back in the day. Yeah. I mean, well, because I just think she's a, like a very gifted songwriter, number one, of course. And then just as a person and as a humanitarian, I don't know if you know all about her book lady stuff that she does. I do not. Oh, so she like pays for like this whole town to go to college. Like if they graduate high school, she pays for their college. And then she also started a whole program where she gives out books. And so people just know her as the book lady where she like gives books to kids in public schools and like through all of like uh, Tennessee, I forget what area it is like outside of Nashville, but she is. I just think she's fantastic. Like she knows exactly what she's doing and everything about her persona is on purpose, you know, like the wigs that she wears and the, you know, you know who she is. She has such a sense of humor and I see her in these interviews and she is just sharp as a tack. And I think she would be so fun and just have so much wisdom to share. Like talk about somebody who's like proud of being themselves and just confident in their own abilities so much to the fact where they are just, you know, ready to, you know, go out and bless other people and, you know, make the world a better place, which is, I mean, really like kind of what I would aspire to do in my dream world is like make the world better. Right. And so, you know, as a musician, yes, I love her so much. And, but then also just as a person, I think I would really appreciate her. So that, that was, she was not on like my radar <laughs> at all. That's, but that's awesome. No, that's great. That's great. Now you, you got me thinking I got to go look up some old Dolly Parton songs. Mm -hmm. Yes, you do. Yes. Mm. I love that great. Hard Candy Christmas. That's my favorite one. So. Okay. okay. Mm. We'll check that out afterwards. <laughs> so for those that are listening, what is a message of encouragement you want to offer them? Uh, I'm really glad you asked me that. I feel like a lot of educators are just people who believe in public education and helping kids need some encouragement right now. And what I would say is something that we kind of talked about earlier is there, you can do it. You are making a difference. I know that so many of us got into this profession and are working with kids and working in schools because we really do want to change the world that we live in, the, our in initial community, our country, our global community. And I know it can feel like we are just this tiny speck, but I promise you that the longer you stay in it and with that right intentions, you are making so much change, um, even if it doesn't feel like it on a day-to-day -day basis, even if like the copy machine was jammed and, you know, T-test didn't go well on that kid, cussed you out or whatever. Those are the ones that come back later and tell you like how much that, you know, you meant to them. And so it's a really hard time to be an educator. And I think it's hard to see that right now. Um, but just know for those of you that are new or those of you that are, you know, have been in, in the game for a while, like, I know that we're changing things because we're changing one person at a time. And then it's just infinitely, you know, bettering our world. So don't give up and ask for help. So, you know, comment on the TikTok, send emails, like reach out, beg, borrow, steal from any teacher that you can find. We have to do it together because no one understands how hard it is who's not in this in this job. I mean, wouldn't you agree? Facts. But, Facts. Yeah. Folks don't know. you. They... <laughs> They don't know. It's easy to talk about mm -hmm. educators and talk about schools and talk about how 
how it's like this or it's like that or it's so terrible or whatever the case may be. But a lot of the folks who are talking never, never been in the classroom, don't know what it's like, don't know the highs and the lows, don't know the challenges. Uh, they also don't know the triumphs. And so that that's a good word right there. That's that's good message. And I, I hope folks receive that. And certainly I hope that they follow you. And so for folks who want to learn more about your work, what it is you offer, content that you're creating that might be resourceful to them, where can they follow you? Well, um, TikTok is probably the fastest way to find me. You can see the videos where I walk through my lessons, my classroom practices, just my daily, you know, everything. I really do kind of treat TikTok as like a professional development community. And so when I'm speaking to, to, you know, to my camera or whatever, I'm talking to hopefully to other teachers, like hoping that they reach out. So that's at Abby Ramos Stanitz. Just check out my TikTok. I'm also on Twitter where I share a lot of like um, more written responses. I share the books that I'm reading and book recommendations that I have because I do read about 60 books a year and most of them young adults. So I can tell you, hey, this is great for this reader, that kind of thing. And then I'm on Instagram at, at Mrs. Ramos Stanitz.com or at Mrs. Ramos Stanitz uh, where I post my different books and just you know, like encouraging things to kind of keep us going. So I learned a long time ago that, you know, in order to reach the students everywhere and reach the audience, social media is a great way to go. So I'm trying to use it for that reason. Absolutely. But, um, and then I'm always available via email. I am always open to helping teachers. I will share with you a resource or just be a sounding board. I think that our professional development community has to be bigger than the people that are on the, our own hallway. It just has to be because this job is just too hard, you know, so... Anyway, reach me in any way. I'll list all those later. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. Oh, it's so great. Well, well, folks, there you have it. Literary mixtape devices. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Check it out. Literary device mixtapes. Check it out. Uh, go to, besides listening to this interview, uh, go <laughs> to Abby's page. And I, I don't know, you'll have to scroll because she has a lot of videos. But <laughs> The, how I learned about this was she created a video talking about literary device mixtapes, uh, and it was fabulous. I, you might have done two. Don't quite remember. But uh, that's how I came across this content. And so extremely engaging. Go ahead. Check it out for yourself if, if you want to see more of a breakdown and, and some visuals in terms of her walking you through this particular lesson. And go to Abby's page on TikTok and make sure you follow her and like her content and share it with others. Mm -hmm. Abby, I appreciate you. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned that you read 60 young adult books a year because I'm going to have to send you my new young adult poetry book. Not not Ooh, out yet, but it's coming, new, it's yes. coming soon. It's going to put in the final touches on it. So going to have to send that to you. And, um, you know, see, see what you think and see if you share with everybody. I can't wait to read it. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you.